Hello everybody, I'm Daniele Buono and this is a seminar on the work we did to improve the security of QEMU by using control flow integrity. Now, I was the main developer of this project, but I also got a lot of help and support from my team at IBM, so I would like to thank them and also thank the QEMU community for the big help in upstreaming this work, uh, especially Paolo Bonzini. So I will start with a bit of rationale on why we wanted control flow integrity in QEMU. Then I will explain how it can be implemented in general and what we needed to do in QEMU. Finally, I will discuss the status of the patches submitted, what we accomplished with this feature, and talk a bit about future work in this area. So the main problem that we have is that QEMU, like any other program, is subject to bugs. This is a table that shows the vulnerability trend over the years. As you can see, we keep finding bugs in QEMU, although at a slower pace than in the past. However, we as cloud providers were mostly interested in integrity attacks, because with those, an attacker can gain access to the provider infrastructure, or even worse, to data and VM of other clients. Now, the main two ways an attacker can use to cause an integrity attack is by using ROP gadgets or indirect function call hijacking. For ROP gadgets, the idea is that you can use a buffer overflow on the stack to write a new chain of return pointers. By chaining small pieces of code ending in a return, an attacker can force QEMU to do practically anything it wants. The second type of attack can also be used with a heap buffer overflow, and the idea here is to find a data structure with a function pointer and change this pointer to whatever the attacker wants. Now, this attack is very effective in C++ because of virtual functions, but also in C code that rely heavily on callbacks. And generally, what an attacker does in this case is to call a function in libc that translates in a system call, like a map to allocate new memory or mprotect to change permissions on primary pages or even system to just execute another program. Okay, so we know that QEMU has vulnerabilities, but how effective are they in causing an integrity attack? Usually, we rate a vulnerability using the CVSS score. And now, if you look at QEMU data from 2017, 41% of vulnerabilities are rated medium or higher, but only 4% is rated high or critical. So one may think that only a small number of vulnerabilities can do a lot of damage. However, the CVSS score may be misleading sometimes. Let's take, for example, the CVE over here. It's rated at 6.5 and it's supposed to cause partial integrity attacks. Well, it turns out that there is an attack demonstration that shows how by hijacking the QEMU timer system, this vulnerability could be used to execute any program on the host. And there is a similar attack that has been demonstrated with another CV that only has a score of 4.6. And then in some cases, multiple vulnerabilities can be stacked to increase the damage. Here, for example, we have a vulnerability with a score of 5 that can only be used to disclose information. However, when paired with another CV with a score of 4.6, we can create an integrity attack. For example, an attack could be constructed where we use mprotect to mark a page of the guest as executable on the host and then be able to run our own code on the host. There is an example on a frack magazine that shows how we can actually execute a shell on the host that can be controlled by the guest. So if you ask us, we would say that just to be safe, any buffer overflow, no matter what the CVS score is, should be considered as a possible integrity attack that can compromise the host. Now, stack buffer overflows can also be used to create a ROP attack, but statistically only 5% of the CVs in QEMU are stack-based overflows. On the other hand, we have up to 31% of them that are buffer overflows, and therefore we think that CVI should be able to stop integrity attacks for about one third of the total vulnerabilities on QEMU. So it's clear that QEMU, as any other program, is subject to bugs, and some of these could be used to cause an integrity attack. So how can we make sure that these bugs do not affect our infrastructure? Well, the most obvious option is to remove bugs once they're found. This, however, has the problem that we can only fix known bugs, and also updating QEMU generally requires stopping the running VM which hurts availability for a cloud provider. Another longer term solution that is currently advocated by some is to completely avoid bugs by using safe languages like Rust. 
This, however, would only affect some type of bugs and is impractical for a project like QEMU that has more than 2.5 million lines of codes. So the only way it would be a uh, total rewrite, which is being pursued by other projects like Cloud Hypervisor. A third option, which is what we are proposing here with Control Flow Integrity, consists in reducing the effectiveness or the damage of bugs. This has actually been done in the past for a long time with techniques like SECOMP, C Linux, C Groups, etc. The idea here is to encapsulate a process and only allow operations that the process may do in normal cases. And the problem here, however, is that QEMU has several different behaviors, so these filters end up being too loose in most cases. Uh, here we think that Control Flow Integrity, or CFI, has better chances to stop unwanted behaviors and actually acts earlier than other techniques. In our opinion, Google is the golden standard for CFI and other security features when we talk about C and C++ code. And this is because of their large production projects, Chromium and Android. The approach they decided to follow is to automate security features by adding them to Clang and LLVM. So now, thanks to Google, Clang has backward and forward added to CFI, hardened memory allocators, and even strong undefined behavior checks. And since these are in the compiler, it could be used for other projects like QEMU with limited work. But before we go into the implementation details, let's see what type of protections we could use. Let's start with the stack. The common way to protect the stack is by using a shadow stack. The idea here is to have a second stack where we store only copies of the return pointers. And then, before executing a write instruction, we make sure that both stacks have the same return address. Now, this can be easily implemented both in software and hardware. However, software versions, especially on x86, are not very safe because there is a risk condition that would allow a second thread to invalidate the return check. On top of that, there are also performance degradations because of the added operations that need to be performed of every function calls. A hardware version of ShadowStack could solve most of these issues. For example, the Intel CT avoids the risk condition by introducing a special call and write instructions that work atomically on the shadow stack. So given that only special instructions access the shadow stack, we could also make it read-only for normal load and store operations. An interesting alternative to the shadow stack is safe stack. The basic idea of a wrap attack is to use a buffer overflow to overwrite a return pointer. SafeStack protects the return pointer by storing them on a safe stack that cannot be accessed by buffer overflows. And this is done by moving all the data structures that can actually cause a buffer overflow in a second stack that we call unsafe and keep return pointers and fixed length variables on the normal stack that we can now call safe. Uh, now, in this case, even if there is a buffer overflow, the return pointers are not accessible because they are in a different memory area. So I would say that safe stack is safer than software-based shadow stacks because it doesn't have the issue of race conditions. It also has very limited performance effects because it basically doesn't add, add instructions. We only need an additional register to store the pointer to the unsafe stack. It does, however, change the position of variables in the stack. So if you have a highly optimized stack, it could cause some performance degradation. So overall, I would say that safe stack is more comparable to other base shadow stack, both in terms of safety and performance. It should be said that a harder base shadow stack could protect the shadow stack from normal store operations, while safe stack doesn't, but a change in the safe stack could only be possible with arbitrary writes, which also open to other types of attacks. So wrap attacks is not really a problem the main concern there. In terms of performance, hardware shadow stacks still has more complex instructions in place of call and red, so we think that in some cases safe stack could actually outperform the hardware-based implementation of shadow stacks. Okay, so let's talk about adding safe stack to QEMU. In theory, we should just add the flag and we will be done. Unfortunately, QEMU makes heavy use of coroutines, and now, since every coroutine must have its own dependent stack, we have a problem here. We can't just create a new safe stack. We also need to create a second unsafe stack for each coroutine. And we also have to make sure that we update both 
when we do a coroutine switch. Now, coroutines in QEMO is either new context or SIGAT stack to create the new stacks, and both of them are not supported by safe stack. So we had to update the implementation in QEMO to manually allocate and update the pointers to the second and safe stack when a new coroutine is created. However, after that, QEMO uses SIGSEC jump and SYNC-LUMP jump, which are already supported by SafeStack, to switch between coroutines. So this is all for stack protection. Let's focus now on how to protect function pointers. Here, the common approach is to use the forward edge control flow integrity. The idea, simplistically, is to check that the function pointed is a correct or allowed function. The main problem is how to define allowed functions. In theory, we could use a call graph that would give us an exact match. However, this is not feasible, so we have to use approximations. And the two most common approximations are to either consider every function in the binary as allowed, and this is what Intel CT or Microsoft CFG do, or to consider as allowed only the functions with the correct signature. This is what Clang is using in their iCall protection, and what Microsoft will be using with XFG in the future. Now, how can you do that? For signature-based checks, uh, Clang uses a order jump table. The idea here is to create a jump table for every function in the binary and order the table by function type. Now, a function pointer will be allowed only if it points to an address in the correct interval. Another option used in some cases by Clang and by XFG is to compute the hash of the signature and store it at the beginning of the function. So before performing the jump, we need the signature hash of the function and we make sure it's the correct one. Now, if you want to only make sure that we're pointing to a function, any function, you can add a special instruction or some data at the beginning of each function. And this is what InterCT does. Now, in terms of protection, obviously, a signature checking is much more powerful and allows much better protection. Now, in this slide, I will try to explain in more detail how Clang iCall works. If you look at the example on the right, we have the real functions, f1 to f6, in the bottom half of the memory. The upper half stores the order jump table. As you can see, the order is different because it's based on a signature. Addresses 0 to 3 store functions that take an integer and a character pointer as an argument, while addresses 4 and 5 store functions that only take one integer pointer as an argument. The idea here is that the compiler will replace any function pointer with a pointer to the corresponding function in the jump table. Then, before executing the call, it will check that the address of the pointer is in the correct address window of the jump table. Uh, if, if that happens, this is considered a valid jump. Otherwise, the program is terminated with an exception. Now, before we try and apply iCall CFI to QEMO, we should make sure that QEMO is respecting the signatures and it doesn't do weird typecasting. Now, the general answer is that yes, QEMO does respect function signatures, but sometimes it is a bit permissive when pointers are used. Specifically, there are cases where a callback type will be a different pointer type compared to the callback function itself. So, for example, you may have the uh, callback function that takes a uh, in a star and the callback type is a char style or a void star. Luckily, Clang has an option to do pointer generalization, and this way we can consider all pointers equal. There are still a few sensitive points where a function won't have a corresponding entry in the jump table. Uh, this happens mostly in two cases. Uh, one is when the function has been generated with just in time compilation because it did not exist at compile time or if we're using a callback from outside the binary like shared libraries, because here Clang has no info on these calls and therefore does not add them to the jump tables. Uh, in particular for QEMO, we have issues in the following things. TCG, when we call a translation block, in TCI, when we interpret instructions, uh, all the callbacks for plugins, modules in general, and the signal handler in QEMO. Now, for all these cases except for modules, we can disable CFI checks on the specific function that we may have issues with. Um, we, can, we cannot do this with modules because in these cases, the changes and the 
disabled areas would be too extensive and pervasive in QE mode. Um, and this would actually become an issue in terms of security because we are disabling checks in a lot of function calls. So for now, we just decided to not support modules. We actually also have an interesting bonus side effect uh, from this work because to order jump tables across the whole binary, Clang has to use link time optimizations. Um, so this actually required us to test and that support in QEMO for LTO. Now, to be fair, most of the work was already done by Mason, but still we, we now have this as an added feature of QEMO. Now, let's talk for a minute about the status of the patches. So both SafeStack and CFI iCall are supported upstream. We also upstreamed a few CI cases for GitLab, but unfortunately, some of these have to be executed only manually because of the significant burden of LTO in terms of compilation and memory. Uh, so basically what happens is that the shared GitLab runners are not powerful enough to allow wide testing of LTO in the daily uh, CI CD. Uh, so both features can be used today already. There are only two main caveats. The first one is that obviously we need to use Clang to compile QEMU and this is a bit of a problem because most distributions are still using GCC for it. Um, and the other big problem is that we cannot use modules uh, and CFI at the same time. Now this is actually becoming a pain point for the future because some distributions like RHEL are moving towards a modular build so we have to they would have to decide if they want to support modular builds or CFI and I'm quite sure that in the, law, in the short term they're gonna do modular builds only. So now that the patches are included upstream, we can ask ourselves, what did we accomplish? Well, if you look at the CVs, a uh, total of 35% of them are buffer overflows. So we can say that by using control flow integrity, we are mitigating about one third of the vulnerabilities and making integrity attacks much more rare. Uh, on top of that, we can also say that we are protected against zero day vulnerabilities at the same time. Now, for the future, the main thing left to do is to include support for shared libraries, and this is mostly important for modules. Uh, the problem, as I said before, is that the jump tables are completed on the binary, so they have no information on external libraries, uh, even if the libraries itself were compiled with CFI. Uh, now, Clank does have a solution for this. It's called cross DSO CFI, and the idea is that if you if your local CFI check fails, instead of just terminating the program like we do now, we check if the address was in a shared library. And if it is, we perform additional checks. Now, in this case, um, if the external library was instrumented with CFI, there is a method to check the signature against the jump table of the external library. Um, however, if the external library was not instrumented, the call would not be protected at all. Uh, and we think this is not really a good idea because to make this protection effective, we would need to instrument the system-wide libc, and we don't want to do that yet. So we would probably suggest a change to LLVM so that we can uh, fail CFI if the external library was not instrumented. Another big issue is that cross DSO CFI does not support pointer generalization. So if we want to make this work with QEMU, we would have to change QEMU in other places where pointer generalization is required. Finally, uh, cross the SOCFI is uh, still experimental and does not work very well with DL open. Uh, and the only way to effectively fix this is to change libc or libdl to properly support cross the SOCFI. So there is a lot of work uh, required here, but we still think that it's possible to do. Uh, this terminates the presentation. Thank you for following.